Welcome to 80s TV Ladies with your fabulous hosts, Sharon Johnson and Susan Lambert Adam. Hello, I'm Susan. And I'm Sharon. We are kicking off a new series of episodes looking at a new old show today. This show has been on our list since the beginning of the podcast. The sitcom A Different World broke ground and changed lives, created and celebrated stars. Just this month, many of the cast members have been touring the country, visiting HBCUs, having cast reunions across television shows like The View, and dancing at the White House with Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre and Vice President Kamala Harris. It's a different world indeed. That's right. The Different World was a spinoff of the hit sitcom The Cosby Show. It premiered on September 24, 1987, and ran for six seasons until 1993. The show looked at the lives of the students of Hillman College, a fictional, historically black college. Season one centered on Dr. Clift Huxtable's teen daughter, Denise Huxtable, played by Lisa Bonet, and her roommates, Jaleesa and Maggie, played by Don Lewis and Marissa Tomei. Bonet and Tomei left the show at the end of season one. The incomparable director, producer, actress, choreographer, amazing woman Debbie Allen, a graduate herself of HBCU Howard University, was brought on to reimagine the show with a mix of old and new cast. Really creating a new focus for the remaining seasons of the Black College Experience. Staying funny while addressing sensitive topics like race, sexual assault, equal rights, HIV, and AIDS. We can't wait to dive into this show, and I'm really excited to kick off this series with today's guest. Our very special guest is an amazing 2020s TV lady, a television writer, producer, and book writer. She has written for over nine TV shows, including Cloak and Dagger and Shades of Blue. Nicole served as supervising producer for SWAT, co-executive producer for The Recruit, and is currently working on the NBC drama Found. She is also the co-writer with George Nolfi of the 2018 movie The Banker, starring Samuel L. Jackson, Nia Long, and Anthony Mackie. She has written an amazing book for aspiring TV writers called The Writer's Room Survival Guide. Welcome to 80s TV Ladies, Nicole Levy. Hi, thank y'all so much for having me. I am so excited to do this. I am so happy to have you on today. Here's the funny thing. I can't remember, other than Twitter, how we know each other. But I feel like I know you, or I met you. So I, I am not sure, because I feel the same way. And I know that I think we have mutuals in common. But it's, it's so funny, because I was like, I just knew the show happened. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. And I feel like I can't remember where. I feel like it might have been at a party somewhere that we might have met. Yeah. You know what? I think we intersect a Kayla Cooper. A Kayla Cooper. That's it. That's it. That's it. Okay. There you That's go. It. Mystery solved. <laughs> Mystery solved. <laughs> she is killing it. She is. Oh my gosh. Uh, out so there being excited amazing. for her. I know. So excited for her. And, and so deserved. Like she's been, you know, like yeah. you, working it really hard. Yes. So, yes. Congrats to you. Thank you very much. All right. So you're in Atlanta now. I am in Atlanta right now. I'm shooting an episode of Found Season 2, which I am very excited and happy to be a part of. Yeah. I haven't been on set since 2021 when I was shooting SWAT because I had been doing shows that shot remotely and or in development since then. Where are you originally from? Uh, I am originally from a little town called Ridgecrest, California. It is between Lancaster and Bakersfield. And I ended up in the middle of nowhere because my father was a career Navy man. And there is China Lake Naval Weapons Center or whatever variation of that name it is right now. It's changed a few times. And that was his final posting. And he and my mom were like, well, we can raise this kid in one place because I'm the baby by a mile in my family. And uh, I spent the next 15 years being like, why did you stay here? Why did you stay here? It was kind of and it wasn't. <laughs> I actually know someone who lives in Ridgecrest. Do you really? I am an Air Force brat. And Bonnie's sister, Donna, and I are have been friends since we were 11. Our parents were stationed in Japan. 
and then Bonnie got married and somehow ended up in Ridgecrest. And she and her husband and her son have been living there ever since. And I think Donna's other sister, Judy, now lives there as well. Wow. And it really was actually a lovely place to be a little kid because we would go out in the desert and play make-believe all day. And like we used to literally make houses like outlined on the dirt with rocks. And then like it would be our fancy like heart to heart house or like whatever, you know, and that, but it was rocks on the ground. So it's a lovely place to be a small child because we had a lot of freedom, a lot of riding the bugs to each other's house, that kind of thing. It was a terrible place to be a teenager. <laughs> How big a town was it? I mean, we had a couple hundred graduating seniors. Like it wasn't tiny, tiny. It was a decent sized small town, but like there was one movie theater. If you didn't want to see those four or five movies, too bad for you. So, like, we were the quintessential essential blockbuster kids, right? Like, go to Blockbuster Friday night, spend two hours picking out movies. Like, that was our jam. <laughs> that was so fun. <laughs> Perusing the shelves. Yeah. <laughs> it was the best. And, like, making fun. We'd be like, we're going to make this movie. But... <laughs> Yes, the answer, by the way, was my brother. Okay. Any movie that you were like, who would ever rent this? My brother rented it. <laughs> the legend is that they were having a rough time and my mom was actually packing to leave him when she found out she was pregnant with me. And so they stayed married for another 28 years until my father passed. <laughs> <laughs> so I held it all together. There you you literally down. saved the marriage. I did. I did. And there were times where I was like, was that the best choice? But they made it. They made a, they made a good go of it after a while. <laughs> People are funny. I mean, look, I, I think all the time, like marriage is hard. There's a reason I haven't done it. It looks like hard work. And I'm a person who's like, like, I kind of just like all my stuff where it is. Like, <laughs> I'm right there with you. <laughs> I'm right there with you. <laughs> I'm like, if somebody went in and like rearranged my kitchen, I would file for divorce that day. Why do you? <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it looks hard. Like it's a lot to keep a relationship that healthy. I mean, the friendships are hard enough. Yeah. And I must say, I feel like that's one of the things where 80s television kind of served us the bill of goods. Because man, marriage looked pretty easy. Yeah, it did. You could you could television. <laughs> Heart to heart, you could be married, millionaires, and have a detective agency and solve, and solve crimes. crimes. Make it to dinner in Paris. You know, it was all good. <laughs> well, even before 80s television, I think if you look at family television, they made it look really easy. Really easy. Um, yeah. So I don't think television did a lot of us any favors in that regard. But Very true. So I'm going to guess you watched a lot of television growing up. So much television, so much. So the joke in our house was always like, because I watched soaps, I watched prime time, like I was in deep. And so I'd always be like, okay, but mom, like, can you not pick me up until three? And can we be home by 745 and like whatever? And she would get so bad. <laughs> She'd be like, are you going to schedule your entire life around the TV show? And so when I got my first job on Ironside, I called her to tell her I had finally gotten a job. And I said to her, so guess what, mom? I am going to schedule my entire life around a TV show. And she <laughs> fell out laughing. <laughs> I love that. And your first show was Ironside? Yeah. The reboot? Yeah. The reboot with Blair Underwood, who is just a delight, an absolute delight. I had been like... Wishing I could work with him again ever since. So I've got to find a way to make that happen. But I love that for our show, that your first show was working on a reboot of a 60s, 70s show. Which I had seen every episode of, by the way, because my parents were huge Raymond Burr fans. And so on the weekend, because we got LETV in Ridgecrest. So on one of those syndicated 13, 9, 11, one of those channels, there was a block of Perry Mason and Ironside. And I remember being at very young, being so confused because Perry Mason would be on first and then Ironside would be on. And I was like, why are you doing the real show now? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that. So, yes, I had seen every episode of the OG Ironside by the time I did the reboot. All right. And when you were brought in to try to get that job, did you start with that? Did you go, by the way, I've seen every episode of the Ironside? 
I did. I did. And uh, Ken Sandelver was our showrunner was like, have you seen that? I was like, no, really, my parents love this show. I have seen all of it. I'm so excited that it, you know, the television watching gets you a job in television sometimes. Yes, (laughs) it should be. I'm sure it did not hurt. I'm sure it didn't hurt. Yeah, my parents were big, love television. So I watched like every rerun of Marcus Welby, every Perry Mason, Ironside, I Love Lucy, like Dick Van Dyke, all the classic great things because they just always had the TV on and they liked to have me come in and watch with them. So what was your path in getting to that first job in television? So a lot of that TV watching, it just didn't occur to me that people wrote it. Like I was so far removed from how the business worked. So I thought I was going to be an actress and I wrote things, but I wrote things just to give myself something to play around to acting. Right. And in my senior year of high school, I took AP English and shout out to Mike Phillips. If he ever were to hear this, it was my AP English teacher. And he, you know, like when you, when you do AP assignments, they put like a number at the top and it's like one through four and four is the best. Right. And I kept getting twos and ones and I was pissed because I'm very competitive about my grades. And it's like, what? and finally he was like, you're writing stuff you think I want you to write, like just write something from your heart. And so the next assignment was to write about a place that scared us. And I wrote about my mother's family um, It's from New Orleans. And my great grandmother, who was the responsible for the spelling of my name, lived in this old, old house that had been a brothel before she bought it. And someone had been murdered in the attic. And so it had all this legend attached to it. But I always felt perfectly safe there because my great grandma was such a bad. So I was like, nobody gonna mess with my great grandma. Come out and go, because she'll take you out. Right. And then she passed away. And the first time we went back after she died, the house terrified me. It was like I saw shadows around every corner or whatever. So I wrote about that feeling and he handed back my paper with a four on the top of it. And it was like, do that. And I was like so excited that like I had done the thing he wanted. And so I started writing more, but I still didn't know that the path was going to change. And it was when I went to acting school, I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts and we had to read all these plays. I'm sure I'm exaggerating this now. In my mind, it was a hundred. It probably wasn't that many, but it felt like we had to read a (laughs) hundred. And in the reading of the plays, I was realizing that like, I loved the storytelling part more than the performing part. And so by the end of the year, I was pretty clear on the fact that like, that was the path I should follow. And so then my parents were elated because they were like, thank God she's going to go to a real college and study a real thing. And I had to work my way through school because, you know, my parents were very sort of average middle class and USC tuition was like, a oh, um, what? And mm-hmm. so I started out in junior college at Pasadena City College. And I got a job as a police dispatcher in San Marino, which is right by Pasadena and worked my way through school. And that was kind of how I got into the actual study of writing and and did all that. P.S. for anybody out there, did not go to film school. You can have a perfectly great career and never go to film school. I was an English major at USC. (laughs) So you were an English major. Yeah. Was this for a bachelor's, a master? So for bachelor's in the English major, they had a creative writing track. Oh, good. So that was my bachelor's. And then they used to have, they no longer have it at USC, a master's called the Master of Professional Writing. And what was great about it was you had to do everything. And so I left that program and got a job in publishing immediately in uh, magazine publishing. And so what I feel lucky about is that my degrees actually helped me keep a roof over my head for the many, many years it took for me to break into television. So it turned out to be really helpful, but very expensive. I, I finally paid my student loans off a couple of years ago, and it was the happiest day of my life. Congratulations. Congratulations. That's huge. Yeah. I paid mine off and it took a long time. Yeah. But I am very concerned about the people that have hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. From school. I literally, 
I could not borrow enough money to go to USC now. Like my total student loan debt for five years between undergrad and grad school is probably two actual years at USC now. Yep. I, I don't know. I couldn't do it now, but I'm I'm real glad I did it when I was like too excited to go to USC to realize the financial burden. That's what I felt. Well, you were smart to go to Pasadena first, yeah. so you you got a couple of years of yeah. a reasonable price. Yes. Yeah, I did. It, that didn't occur to me. I got out to USC, and then I was like, why am I? I came to go to film school. Why am I taking English 101? Like, I could have stayed in Georgia for that. Yeah. I have some friends who two of their three kids are doctors. So you can only imagine the size of their student loan debt. But you've paid off yours. Yes, yes. Woo! (laughs) (laughs) That really is amazing. I want to get to a different world. Did you watch this show in the 80s? I did. I did. And what was fascinating, like I hadn't thought about it in so long, but I was talking with another friend about the fact that I was going to do this and I was rewatching the show. And what I remembered so clearly, even from, from the first episode, is it was the first time that the idea of an HBCU was even a thought to me of a thing I could do because neither of my parents had done that. And it sort of wasn't like a thing that we talked about in our house. And again, my parents have both grown up in the South, but now we were all the way out in California. So they were definitely not suggesting anything that meant I was moving back across the country. They were very like, oh, stay in California, stay close to us where we can keep an eye on you. And I had seen like the contrast because of school days, which made going to an HBCU seem like a terrible idea for me because the way that the light skin girls get treated in that is not great. And so I was like, oh, like that might not be a thing. And then when I saw Hillman and a different world, I was like, well, that looks great. And it was so fascinating because my parents were, they were like, sweetheart, we just don't know. Like if you want to look into that, you should, but like you've never spent time in a predominantly black environment. Like, I don't know if that's a right choice for you, but that's not a conversation we ever would have had if I hadn't seen the show and come running in and been like, but it looks great. What if I had to go to school like Hillman? And they were like, well, um, I guess we're having this conversation now. <laughs> now. I didn't even know HBCUs existed when I was growing up, maybe partially because you know, being a military brat, we lived different places. I mean, I was in Japan for junior high and first two years of high school. And at that point, it was like, uh, I didn't know what the heck I was doing in terms of trying to pick a college. Uh, I had no clue. I think, I, I think like you, and I'm several years older than you, that Hillman was really kind of my first exposure to HBCUs, sad, as sad as that may seem. Yeah, like I knew Howard existed. Like I knew of Howard. I knew what it was. Another family friend had a son who had gone there or was going there, but like it still just didn't, it never was like a, oh, that's a thing I should consider until I saw the show. And it was like so eye opening to me that like there was this whole other part of life in like black culture that I just didn't know anything about in large part because I had grown up in such a different space. So it was really fascinating to like watch that and sort of see, right, like there are a whole bunch of different kinds of people at the school and it didn't have that connotation of any one sort of person was wrong. It was sort of like, no, like we're we're sending the message that like all of our blackness is good, which I so appreciated. Yeah, not to mention the differences in the socioeconomic backgrounds of all of them as well. Yes. And the ages. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. Like I remember I had not, definitely had not seen the first season in a really long time. And so I rewatched it and like, I forgot how big a reaction everybody had to Jaleesa being older and divorced. You know, it was such a big deal. And I'm so used to being older than most of the people in my spaces in Hollywood. So it's like, damn, y'all, like, calm down. She's not 24. Like. (laughs) It was. It was very, very <laughs> huge, you know, reaction in that it's the first episode that they're just yeah. kind of can't stop talking about it. And they're <laughs> gossiping about her. Yeah. And I just I found that so fascinating. But I mean, at the time, like I probably would have had the same reaction. But like having now lived and been, you know, 
the person who started by career later. So I'm older than most of the writers in my rooms. It's always a little interesting. But I had forgotten, by the way, that there was also ever another version of the theme song when they read the Franklin version. And there's a different one for season six. It's the boys to men version. Yes. Which is also, it's good. And like, as soon as I heard it, I remembered like loving it. But I completely forgot the season one version. Completely forgot it. Yeah. <laughs> Aretha showed up and out the window it went. Well, it's hard to beat Aretha Franklin. It is. It is. <laughs> I do love that that theme song was co-written by Don Lewis. I know. I know. That's so cool. Like, and the fact that like they didn't know like that she had been cast and then had also gotten hired to co-write the song. It's hilarious. I didn't me. know that either. I didn't know that part. I didn't either. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Like it was like, you know, two separate arms completely. And so I was reading a thing where she talked about like, and then we're like, oh, wait, what? Like she's in the show. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's having a renaissance right now because of the tour to raise awareness and money for the historically black colleges. A different world is, uh, is, is, you know, dancing at the White House, you know, as you do. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, um, you know, with our vice president, Kamala Harris. <laughs> yeah. The Road Trip Reunion special, did you guys see that? It aired right after Sinbad had his stroke, but they oh. did like on, on E, it was like a road reunion. trip reunion. And I think they talked about it there. And it was so funny because that when Jasmine Guy and Chris Summer stand up to do the step routine and like, they still remember it. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Cause that's one of my favorite episodes. I was <laughs> and they were talking about it in the special, right? Is like, for Jasmine, who had this whole dance background, to have to sort of come at dance from this very stuck up Whitley place, as opposed to the freedom of movement that she has. And then Chris Summer, who is very coordinated and very graceful to have to constantly play this these pratfalls. And so the dance part of that, and they were saying like, at a certain point, Debbie walked in and was like, can the child just learn the dance by the end? But it was hilarious because they were like, I think I still remember. And they get up on the stage and start doing it. And and then they cut to the clip and you're like, oh, my God. Like, I remember watching this for the first time. What I love about the show is they're just musical numbers and musical stars walking in. And as a person that loves musicals and loves theater, loves theater people, I'm like, yes. Yeah, it was so big, like you know, the parade of people like the Gladys Knight thing where like Whitley and Delisa team up <laughs> was so great. And then the Heavy D episode where Whitley's like snack talking hip hop to Heavy and he's just like, oh, really? <laughs> but and there's people that I had just forgotten ever were on the show when you're rewatching episodes. Forgot Blair Underwood was on it. Forgot, you know, Halle Berry was ever on it. The parade of people who went through it. Yeah, that's been an ongoing theme in the the shows that, that we've watched and during this podcast and seeing so many people that we know so well now at the very beginnings of their careers. It's so much fun. And you're right. It just has just a murder's row of people who went through that show. Yeah. Which is great. So I was thinking because I watched the now or what is the technical finale, right? The Whitley and Dwayne mm -hmm. leave yeah. finale yesterday. And it occurred to me. We're in the 80s Diane Carroll had, right? Between Dynasty and that, like, good on you, Diane. Like, she came back with, I am here. I have earned all the adulation mm -hmm. adore me. Yes. <laughs> and I, I kind of love that. I definitely feel like that has to be the Debbie Allen of it all, of like, come in, be a diva, let's go. And, you know, there was so much room for women to come in and be superstars in this show. Both literally, you know, <laughs> because they were yeah. in the episode that I think the one you were talking about is season two, episode five, three girls, three, where they're competing yes. to be the backup yep. singer. And then they get the dream sequence where they sing with Gladys Knight. It's <laughs> great. It's amazing. And you're like, OK, it was really a lot of just beautiful moments. I remember season one more than the rest of it because I think I was then I just didn't catch it that often, you know, and of course I watched the spinoff of The Cosby Show. Mm -hmm. But then I, when I did catch it, it did always feel like, well, 
there's a huge star, and it must have been why I watched it. Like I must have read the TV guide and went, "Oh, well, I'm going to tune in for that." You Ooh, know, the TV guide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a gift as I'm rewatching it to be like these young, amazing, talented people that are just sort of starting, and then these incredibly talented women that are coming in and basically kind of getting their flowers a little bit in being able to kind of do a really great episode where they're performing or they're, you know, being the diva, you know, it's great. Yeah. I, I, that's what I'm really appreciating on this rewatch is the cast. Yeah. It just, there's so much joy to like all the episodes, even when they do hard things, like the way that they still find the joy and friendship and the, the way that people show up for each other in those kind of things, which I think is part of what I loved about it. And like, I like a lot of things from the first season, but I think there was just the energy level went up so much when Debbie came. Yeah. That it just, it grabbed you the second that it started. Like there was just a like, and you're sitting down and you're going to watch like every episode. And I'm not, it's just, however she made that happen. It was magic. And it just, the college feels like more people are there. I mean, every yes. frame is filled. It's really interesting, particularly that second season, because it's so, you know, it's so different look wise from the first season, even though the sets are all the same, like, you know, for the most part. And yet it really does have an energy of excitement mm -hmm. and an energy of camaraderie. And it's just filled with people. Yeah. Like, all the time, which is really neat. Yeah. Like, I wanted to go to the pit so bad. Yeah. <laughs> like it just it just seemed like the most fun place on earth like everyone was always there everything was ever, always happening there like breakups and makeups and all the things were happening at the pit let's take a quick break we'll be right back and we're back i was trying to figure out how they shot it it feels very you have a feeling it has a different feel or a different look than other other yeah, three kinds of that time period. Oh, it looks much different than the Cosby Show. It looks much different than what I would call a traditional sitcom. Even though there are times it looks like a sitcom, there are times it looks like they picked up a camera and went right in to me. Yeah, I mean, I think you're. I think that's some of that energy feeling, right? Of just everybody's young and in movement constantly, and somehow they were able to capture that. Yeah, and there's a lot more locations. Because, you know, like I was like, now they're in a basketball. Now they're outside. Like for a sitcom, it didn't feel constrained. Yeah. The way most 80s sitcoms definitely felt like, oh, this is all being shot on a soundstage. And this is all being shot in these six sets they have. Yeah. No, I agree. The scope felt really big. And even when you could tell like, oh, we like pull the car into the stage or whatever to do stuff. I don't know. You just felt it felt a little bit different. Like the episode where Freddie goes out with the, the oh, date rate episode. Yeah. 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 And like, even though that's clearly like we pull the car on a stage and we put some grooms or whatever, it still had that feeling of she's all alone yeah. out there till Dwayne managed to come in the roof of the car. Right. So you still got the feel of that, even though it was shot on a stage, which I just was like, so I know at the time I would not have noticed, but now as a, as a, TV writer and producer being like, damn, like that was good. Just they built the atmosphere so well for that scene. Yeah. And that's uh, No Means No, season two, episode 20. And that was what was interesting is, again, it's got some really funny bits and it's a really serious episode. Their special episodes didn't have that special sitcom episode feel. They felt like normal episodes, which also were dealing with really important stuff. I really love the conversation between the two guys in the basketball scene. That's that's I think the basketball yes. scene that I was talking about where Dwayne is discovering information in that scene that starts to make him very uncomfortable. Yes. That his friend is talking about, oh, yeah, I basically force women yeah. because that's what they want. Right. And it's OK. And for the time, you know, were there other conversations that were that? complex because he liked the guy right yeah he, he wasn't a bad guy. he wasn't a that bad was guy thing. yeah yeah i was really impressed with how subtle 
and conversational that episode in particular was and also just the joy that she has for that guy when she's in you know talking with her friends and and she's giddy and you remember that feeling so it's crushing right like it's crushing i was really impressed with it in terms of being a sitcom approaching a really important vital topic that's really hard to talk about and was harder to talk about in the 80s because we didn't have language, you know. Absolutely. And it was very impressive. That scene that you hit on, I was, it, you're right, because it's that thing of he's not done anything to appear to be a bad guy. So like that uncomfortable moment where you start to realize, oh, are you not a good person? We don't do with this information. Like we've all experienced that in our lives for different reasons, but it's just we guys sort of had that moment and I was so struck by that. And then when Dwayne goes to talk to Walter, Mm. And at the end of that scene, when Dwayne says, dudes need to talk about this stuff too. And it was like so progressive for the 80s, right? That like, this isn't just a conversation for women to be having. You all need to be talking about this too. Those of you who know better need to be telling the other men, this is not how you do it. Watching it, I was like, oh my God, this was so brave. (laughs) It was so like unbelievable. I mean, I don't remember this show being called out for being so progressive other than it being said at a, like on all levels. Like, and I knew they were happening, but I think it was a little bit like, you know, just the subtlety of how they're dealing and having these discussions. It was very unsitcom y. It, it approaches the Cagney and Lacey level of we're talking about things that don't normally get talked about. And in a way that's entertaining and sideways and leaves you with as many questions as answers. Looking back on it, I'm wondering if one of the reasons why it, the show didn't get the credit it deserved for these kinds of things may have had something to do with the fact that it's a spinoff of The Cosby Show. And that's the big thing in the room. And oh, by the way, there's this other little show over here, how, however successful it might be. It's, you know, the Cosby show is kind of sucking all the air out of that room. Of course, if not for the Cosby show, it wouldn't have existed. But also maybe if not for the Cosby show, it might have gotten more notoriety and more kudos for the the types of things that they were doing in that respect. Because they did a lot of that kind of thing throughout the course of the show. Absolutely. They did, but they did not get respect for it. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. And I I think you're right, Sharon. I think it was a lot of that idea, right? it was a little like TV nepotism. It was like, well, how hard could they have it? You know, they're spun off of the Cosby show. And it was right. like, well, yeah, but they're not the Cosby show. They're doing a completely different thing. It's not like they just did Cosby show 2.0. And it was like, it's the same show. It's a completely different thing. And I think for the critics, who are the people who always make those decisions about buzz and no buzz, I think they never kind of let go of the struggles that season one had. And they just couldn't give the credit where credit was due of the work that was done to like put the show on its feet in season two, right? All credit to the season one folks, because there's a lot of fun to be had there. And there's a lot of interesting moments, but when you watch season one into season two, the change is so huge. And you realize like how much work was really done between seasons to like make it the show we all remember. And I think like that deserves so much credit because that's a really difficult thing to do. You know, the most modern day equivalent I can think of. And again, people who never got the credit for it, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., right? Completely different kind of show. But the first season, there was so much like, oh, it's trying to be case of the week and blah, blah, whatever. And of course, nobody knowing that Marvel's forcing them to tread water for 16 episodes before the whole Winter Soldier thing drops and S.H.I.E.L.D. falls apart, right? The way that that show completely pivots and, like, amps up the momentum becomes this whole, like, huge, huge show on a broadcast budget. They never get enough credit for that. And I think it's so hard for people to let go of the harder parts for most shows. I think the only show I've ever seen people really let go of those, like, rocky early moments is 30 Rock. 
And I would say maybe Parks and Rec too. I, I don't yeah. watch yes. either of those. Parks and Rec probably too. Yeah. yeah. And The Office. Yeah. Seinfeld, some shows get that opportunity to figure things out. And then once it's figured out, get to move forward in whatever manner the, the show is. But what's yes. interesting, I think, about A Different World, as you were just saying, is there's a conscious reset, right? These other shows, it's the same team shifting and figuring out the show. And that seems to be a half hour comedy path is we we have a general idea. We have some cool characters, but we really don't know where to take them until the end of season one. And then by season two, where everybody's just cooking with gas, which apparently you shouldn't do anymore. But <laughs> but this show had to kind of reboot itself, right? With the loss of Lisa Bonet, with the loss of Marissa Tomei, Bonet and Tomei, I realized rhyme when I was setting <laughs> okay, up. That. I was like, I had never realized that before. Um, so Bonet and Tomei left. <laughs> and um, the real desire to lean into the historically black college world, I think, and really honor it yeah. even more than the being a concept for the show, I think was really smart and allowing the show to do that. Cosby had broken all that ground and you can't have the show without the Cosby show for all sorts of reasons. But then what this show became, you're right, does not get credit because of the shadow of the Cosby show, and I would argue, because it's women running it. I would 100% agree with that. I think that is the historical nature of our business is, you know, it's why I think that it was that TV nepotism of, well, I mean, it's a spinoff, so they don't, it's not like it's hard. It's like, you're saying that because it's a bunch of women. Like, if someone else had run the show you would have probably been like, oh my God, look at the heroes work they did. Yeah. Rebooting the show and all of those things. And, you know, sort of to our point of bringing in the hard topics and keeping the funny and all of that. Like I hadn't watched If I Should Die Before I Wake in quite a while. And so I watched it. And I mean, it, it brought me to tears because it took me right back to what it felt like to watch people with HIV and AIDS treated like monsters and how infuriating it was to be young and watching that and being like, nobody has control over it. Nobody is choosing to get sick. Like what is wrong with you people? That you're treating people like they don't deserve to be hugged anymore. And they don't deserve to be loved anymore because they're sick. And the way that they were able to do that. I mean, there is a part of me, I'm not saying Obviously, I am friends with a great many male writers. I have like all of those things, but like the touch that was required to do that, there was a such a nurturing undertone of that, right? Daddy being in a world, right? Coming from dance where lots of people were suffering and being lost from this illness and being able to like infuse that to put it out into the world, right? Was just so monumental and so valuable. And knowing that we still need messages like that in the world, like watching that was just such a reminder to me, right? You think about the political climate right now. Can we close just remember that everybody is a human being? Like, can we stop with the othering and sectioning people off? And like, I think that's part of why it hit me so powerfully again, not just the memory, but like, it's still so necessary. Yeah. And I think so much of this show, like, Showing the differences in young people, right? Showing the, you know, Kim having the pregnancy scare versus Whitley wanting to wait longer to ever have sex. You know, all those things, it's like we start to think of people as a monolith. And it's such a great reminder that there's all different kinds of people in the world because you see them all at the school. It makes me think about the fact that this kind of storytelling, the kinds of topics that were touched on, not just in a different world, but in a lot of shows in the 80s, we don't really see it anymore. We don't see that kind of thing talked about in the context of the characters and people's life experiences. And I really kind of miss that. I wish there was more of that because I think it helped make a lot of difference, in my opinion, in the AIDS crisis. It helped to help people go, okay, you know, whatever I've been hearing and however scary this is and not to minimize it, but... Maybe there's a better way, different way 
to think about this, to deal with this? I think there is such a an absence of that in some some of our shows, and I really miss it. Thinking about, I think the the most recent version of that I can think about is how people talked about how Modern Family helped so many people get over the hump with gay marriage. Right? It was like, oh, we love we love them. So I guess it doesn't look that different, and it's all fine. And like people were able to kind of take their blinders off a little bit. And look, procedural television has bought me a house. I'm grateful for it. I've done a lot of stories I cared about in the procedural space, but it does feel like there's a little fear now of talking about real things in too real a way. Yeah. It makes me sad. Like, I'm like, I want Hill Street Blues again. I want, you know, homicide. Like, I want those things that talk about life in a way that isn't cops are perfect or cops are all terrible. It's like, we can talk about human beings doing a really difficult job. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the sitcom world, again, it's like, trying to make space for you know not everybody looks the same not everybody comes from the same place and my friend Debbie Wolf is doing the Lopez versus Lopez show right now and I'm just so proud of her because it's like at least it's someone different right on television it's a different kind of family than we've seen in quite a while and different economic situation different everything and it's like thank god (laughs) And I I know that 80s television and the people making it felt a need to talk about this stuff because there wasn't the Internet. There was newspaper articles, but television kind of often would break ground on this stuff. And this is doing that same thing. To your point, I just I remembered there was a quote that I had pulled That was from a People magazine article quoting Don Lewis, who starred as Julissa. When a different world comes along, you're adding people of color, various shades of brown and financial elevation, social awareness or unawareness. We painted a palette where there was someone for everyone. So anything we did, anything that our characters did to raise awareness or elevate the various facets of who we are in this fabric of this country and in our culture, I think that's what still resonates today because we're all striving to be our best selves. Uh, it's amazing. The facet of the historically black college experience. And as a white person and a white woman, it opened up a world to me. It also was like, well, that looks amazing. But I was from Georgia. I grew up in Decatur, Georgia. Morehouse College is there. Spelman College is there. I knew they were there. I didn't know they were historically black colleges and universities. So I didn't know what they meant until this show. And I didn't know what they meant to the culture until this show. And that was and has been still a real revelation Because it's not what was being put on television then, and it's not as much being put on television now. Documentaries, yes. Internet, yes. There's a way to find all this information, but it's not as sort of beautifully stitched into a story, which I find is such a great way to learn and to absorb information because it doesn't feel like you're learning. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. I mean, when you think about, you know, Firstly, all credit to Jasmine for the performance and then also the way the writers wrote around Whitley, right? That like there's so many shows in which Whitley's just the bad guy. Where she's just the rich spoiled girl and she's always looking down on people and like, yeah, she's pretty and yeah, she's hot, but wait, like she's kind of a bad And the fact that Whitley was always an actual person, even when she was doing all those things, like even in, in, cause I think the surprise birthday party is like before Debbie got there, right? Where she thinks everyone forgot her birthday. Mm-hmm. But even that, we've all been the person who was like, everyone forgot it's my birthday. Nobody remembered it's my birthday and how crushing that is. And to like watch Whitley, who has everything, go through that moment, right? And I just, we're watching it like really jumped out to me as a writer now, like how, they wrote the other characters' reactions to her in a way that was not basically like, oh, really such an well, It was like, we love her. Let's be patient. Let's help her get to the thing, which is such a big difference in how you write the characters around her. 
And so that, you know, when Dwayne falls in love with her, you totally believe that because Whitley's always been a good person in her heart. She just had a very narrow worldview and they helped open it up for her. And I just think sometimes watching TV now, like if there was a character like Whitley, I would 100% expect her to be written as like the butt of jokes and not get that level of humanity. And I think that's a little of what I find is missing. Yeah. And I think it's there from season one. Yeah. Dwayne was written a certain way in season one. And so when he becomes the man he becomes, it's it's college. Like it's where you suddenly realize like, oh, people actually do learn and grow up and make mistakes and correct them and develop their personalities to their full extent, if allowed. Yeah. So I will admit, it's so funny, like at the rewatching, I remember that for the last season, I think I would watch and like really watch for the characters who had been there all along and kind of tune out a little bit on the younger characters because I was hitting this stage where I was tired of younger characters and shows <laughs> where the young people were always the smartest person in the room and I was like, whatever. But I thought it was so lovely to watch the effect that our original characters had on those younger characters because that's what happens, right? You grow up and then you're the person the next generation wants to be. Looking back, I'm like, oh no, I like that. There's a huge evolution in this show. That was the other thing that I had forgotten, like how it shifts and adds characters and people and Sinbad. And, you know, like I just sort of had forgotten the richness of the cast. Yeah. You know, and how much the teachers come in. Yes. And it wasn't technically on my list, but somehow I ended up watching it was Radio Free Hillman because I kind of make a list of what highlights I'm going to hit first. But of course, I was watching it this week and thinking about all the college campus protests that are happening right now and going, God, I mean, I can't believe they did this. Right. And yet that's what was happening in the 80s, too. And it's so resonant. Right. Like you want young people to be passionate and protesting and you want them to be able to do that safely. And you want colleges to make room for that. It should be where they're doing it safely. Yeah. And that's hard. And that's what the episode is all about. It's crazy. It's crazy. It was stunning to me to like rewatch it and realize how much of the subject matter is still so relevant. It's like amazing and also makes me a little sad Mm -hmm. because you're like, oh, really? We haven't we haven't pushed past some of this stuff. But I feel that way. I rewatch Hill Street Blues all the time. And I feel that way with Hill Street as well. Like if you could digitize out with giant bricks of portable phones and stuff, it, it would feel pretty current, honestly, for a lot of the social commentary. But it really I think that just shows that they really had tapped into something that is pretty universal to being young and then also very specific to being young and black they were able to do both those things which i think is is so tricky and hard yeah admittedly um even when i was a kid for the most part i was not particularly interested in shows about kids or teenagers i was always interested in what the grown-ups were doing (laughs) but it really has been remarkable re-watching it to see just how how remarkable it really is that I just didn't appreciate at the time. That sort of thing has been one of the gifts of doing this podcast and getting to go back and rewatch these shows and to learn to better appreciate what was happening and the women who were behind it, which, frankly, I never thought about it. I just figured these things showed up on my TV without really giving a lot of thought as to how that happened. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's funny you say that, that, you know, because it was about the teens, it's really unusual to me that I stuck with this show because like I was the girl who Thursday nights at 10 was like, you know, old school TV with the dial between Hell Street and Knott's Landing because I couldn't shoot because couldn't record it, couldn't do anything, like had to be there. So I was like, let's have, let's have, oh, it's not an Abbey scene. Okay, let me go back. Like I would like go back and forth trying to keep up with both shows. Because I was like, screw you, networks. I am going to know what's happening on both my shows. It's cool. <laughs> I <laughs> love that. That never occurred to me. I wish it had. 
Oh my God. The amount of lectures I got about how I was destroying my eyesight because I would just be on cystic syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it never occurred to me either. I don't know why it never occurred to me, but it didn't occur to me. Oh my either. God. You and Stan Zimmerman was creating networks yes. and uh, developing his his own network schedule. Like, uh, you guys were, were much more proactive. I was just trying to, you know, go through the TV guide and go, I guess I have to do this one. Desperate times, yeah. desperate <laughs> measures. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I came up with all kinds of creative solutions for things. Like, I was a um, stat girl for the varsity football team. Which meant every Friday I was at a football game, but I was also obsessed with Matt Houston, which is ridiculous, but I loved it. And so I got my friend's mom because they got a VCR and I convinced my friend's mom to record it for me. So then every Saturday I would go over to their house and watch it so they could record over them. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> when I was a kid, we had one TV, as you did. And so to we would get into fights, I guess, about what to watch. And my mom finally said, okay, you each pick one show that we will watch no matter what. And everybody gets to pick a show. So I gave it a lot of thought, thought about what everybody else liked, thought about what I liked. And I deliberately picked a show that even though it may not have been my favorite, I knew nobody else wanted to watch, but I did. And I still got to watch other shows that I liked because other people pick them. So you got to do what you got to do to get your TV is basically yeah. what I'm saying. Because <laughs> I was just such a TV junkie and my parents got tired of listening to me flipping the thing around. So they put a TV in my room. Oh, wow. They were like, we're done. Go to your bedroom. <laughs> do what you're going to do. We're done with you. In ninth grade, we had to write a journal and we had to write in it Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. I was like, I don't want to talk about my life. So on Mondays, I would talk about what happened in the Friday episode of Matt Houston. And then they would have shown the preview. And then I would have also seen the ad for the next episode of Heart to Heart. So then Wednesday, I would, I would like Monday guess what I thought was going to happen based on the ads. And then Wednesday, I would write about what really happened on Heart to Heart. And then Friday, I would write about what I hoped was going to happen on Matt Houston. And then Monday, I would come in and talk about, oh, well, here's what really happened. And so at the end of the year, my teacher wrote a note at the top of the journal. And she was like, this is literally the most entertaining journal I have ever read. <laughs> Do you still That's have fantastic. that journal? I wish I did. No, Please. my mom is so loud. No. <laughs> I know. But it was probably my earliest not knowing it. But I was kind of writing fanfic, right? Because I was mm -hmm. kind of like... Here's what I hope happens. And they're like, well, this is what they did, but here's what they should have done instead. <laughs> oh my God. That's awesome. You had to be a TV writer from that from that <laughs> right. moment on. I didn't realize it, but clearly it was already trying to come out. <laughs> I friggin' love that. So what other shows? I mean, in the street blues to me is the greatest show in the history of television. Love that show. And usually when people try to debate me, I'm like, yeah, that show wouldn't exist if Hill Street hadn't existed. So I still win. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because it really did. It changed how dramas got made and it allowed all those other shows we love to come into existence, right? Huge Wonder Years fan. Which again, unusual because it was about kids, but it felt like it was told from such a grown up perspective. So I think I always still really keyed into it. Heart to heart, obviously. Well, started pre-80s, but Dallas. Dallas was my jam. Knott's Landing because of that dynasty. All the Falcon Crest, all the nighttime soaps. I was there for all of them. See, I was a CBS nighttime soap person. I resented, I resented Dynasty for, for trying to steal Dallas's thunder. So I refused wow. to watch it. <laughs> And then Cagney and Lacey. My mom got me on Cagney and Lacey, so I loved that you guys talked about it. Scarecrow and Mrs. King. It was my jam. Had to be home to watch it every week. And then probably in the, you know, starting to get more grown up, like my other life felt like a game changer to me because I just didn't know a show could look like that and feel like that. Like it was so atmospheric and so like... Mm -hmm. Also, you could never make that pilot now. Like, I don't know how long it's been since you watched the Miami Vice pilot. We are not even in a scene together in the first hour. Really? 
Oh, wow. They don't meet until like the end of the first hour, basically. Like, Does his, he have a different partner or something? Do they have a different partner? Yes. Yeah, so he starts out with a different partner and Rico's in town without permission because he's from New York and he's working in K. So like Rico just seems like a guy in the mix of the drug world or whatever. And then it's like, oh, no, I'm really a cop from New York. I'm here to find who killed my brother. And then it's like, oh, like, no, you can never get away with that now. They <laughs> Move it left. <laughs> yeah. I had been keeping a list of all the TV shows I had ever watched in my lifetime. And the rule for the list was I had to have gotten through at least one complete episode for it to be on the list. If I got mad during the pilot and turned it off, it didn't count. Admittedly, there were shows on there that I would not have watched by choice, but I used to do closed captioning for television. So did I. And so I still watched them. They still counted. Did you really? I did. I worked for a company in the 90s called um, Captions Inc. Oh, yes. I remember the name. Yeah, I worked for Vitag. Yes, I remember the name as well. Anyway, <laughs> you guys could have met. <laughs> we could have, I know. And so I was getting close to a thousand. So Amanda Green, who's one of my dear friends that I met on that show, was like, you have to write about what you've learned from watching a thousand TV shows. And so I did. So much of my taste buds came from watching, right? I know I don't like a show where people die every week. Mm -hmm. It's like, who dies this week? I'm out. Because I love TV because I get to build a relationship with the characters. If you're going to kill somebody, it better count. And I realized like a lot of that's from the shows I watched growing up and how much of an impact it would have. Right. Because they used to be so skittish about killing people off on shows and like the impact it has, like when it happens that you're just so it should really matter. And I think that's one of my biggest takeaways from being a fan of TV. So I'm very appreciative to all of those writers that I watched growing up who were like, make it count. If you're going to do it, make it count. And you also have written a book. I did. I wrote the writer's room survival guide. A little against my will at first, Carol Kirshner, who was an amazing human being who administers the CBS Writers Mentorship Program, which is now the Paramount Program, and does showrunner training at the Writers Guild, mm. was sort of one of the first people to believe in me as a TV writer. And thus, uh, I adore her. And she was like, I really think somebody should write a book like this. And I was like, someone should. That's a great idea. And like the fourth time she was like, Nicole, you, I'm trying to tell you, you write the book. <laughs> I was like, I don't think I have, I don't want to write a book. And then I wrote a table of contents and sent it to some friends to be like, what am I missing? And they told me, and I was like, oh yeah, I have a lot to say about that. And suddenly I had an idea for a book. So there you go. Congratulations. Don't screw up the lunch order. And other keys to a happy writer's room. Several people have been isn't that more about the writer's assistant? And I was like, no, it's the person in the writer's room who makes lunch difficult. If you're in the writer's room and it's like, I want to disparage a restaurant, but restaurant X, which I hate, I am not going to throw a fit because we're going there. I'm going to just go to the commissary and grab my own lunch. But the people who were like, we don't want that. Or if you're going to go there, can you also stop at this other place that's like two blocks away and do whatever? I was like, no, unless you were the showrunner, you either say thank you for my lunch or you take care of yourself. You do not run the PA crazy. So I did. I got my whole start in procedurals. And I think a lot of that was I grew up in a house where my parents loved cop shows, right? My parents were also responsible for my Dallas addiction. They were responsible for China Beach. China Beach. Yeah. There were definitely some shows that my parents got me into that were not the traditional like cop shows, but like Hill Street was my parents' fault. Homicide, I think I found on my own, but like, you know, Police Woman and McMillan and what, like all of those shows. And I had always enjoyed them. And so definitely a lot of my early work was doing specs of whatever the modern day equivalent of their shows were and like really honing that and trying to find my way in. The first spec I ever wrote was for the X-Files. And it's dreadful, but it taught me a lot. So it was you right, like you you have to learn the the stuff to get better because it sounds great. And then you sit down and do it and you're like, oh this is hard. <laughs> yes. 
it's hard work to write an hour of television. <laughs> it doesn't just magically come out of you. But I, so I did a lot of that procedural work. The show where I willed myself to the place. I had always loved genre on top of my procedurals. Buck Rogers, OG Battlestar, original Star Trek, Next Generation. Next Generation is my my touchstone. I love it. So that world had always fascinated me. And I read comics, right? Never occurred to me in a million years that writing comic book TV shows was going to be a thing. That seemed like, like I had watched original Flavor Wonder Woman. It didn't seem like they were, that was coming back, right? Incredible Hulk, great. Something I watched as a kid, never coming back again. And then here I am in the TV business and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. happens. And now suddenly comic book TV shows are a thing. And I don't think it is an exaggeration to say that I just sent everyone I knew, I Kayla included, to the Marvel offices to be like, how did you not interview Nicole? <laughs> so that by the time i got a meeting at marvel i walked in the door and they were like so i heard you watch everything and i was like i do which show would you like to talk about first <laughs> and that is how i got my job on cloak and dagger i got off of that got a meeting with joe pikaski who was like even though he teased me mercilessly about my agents of shield love hired me anyway <laughs> <laughs> I did. What, I'm so glad you brought up Cloak and Dagger because I'm a big fan of Cloak and Dagger. I love Olivia Thank Holt. You. I think I love her as an actress. And I know Joe Pukowski. So I was like watching that show sort of from the I wish I wish there was more of that show. So I do too. Believe me, like I really thought we were going to get to go back for season three and it, we were pretty hopeful until they killed us. But it was just an absolute dream come true. Like. You know, there's always that fear that you're going to get to do the thing you always dreamt of doing and it's not going to be great. But it was Joe runs such a good room and like the writers were great. The cast was great. It was just such a terrific job. And like I would I would still be there. Can you tell us a little bit about your show now that you're working on? Sure. So found for those of you who have not seen it, stars the amazing Shanola Hampton as a woman who, um, when she was in high school, was kidnapped by her teacher and held prisoner for a year. And he kidnapped a second child and she was like, no, and escaped and saved herself and the other child. He got away. He has now been at large for 20 some odd years. This is not really a spoiler because if you saw the commercials for the show, you definitely got this was she now finds people for a living, specifically people who police are less likely to be looking for. So people of color, people from the LGBTQIA you know, community, people who fall through the cracks. So that's her vocation. She has a whole team of people who help her do that. She also has her kidnapper locked in her basement. She tracked him down and is now holding him prisoner forcing him to help her find other bad guys. So that's kind of the premise. We left you on a very big cliffhanger. Uh, well, I should say the other writers did because I was not there season one, but I am now part of season two. It's so great to me because anyone who follows me on socials knows that I have been reposting stuff from the Black and Missing Foundation for three years, I think, since the documentary aired on HBO. When people who are Black and Brown go missing... They don't get the media attention that a lot of other folks do. And so to get to make television that talks about something that matters to me that much is pretty exceptional. You get to do some really fun work in this business. It's not often that you get to also talk about something that you're that passionate about when you haven't been able to create the show. So it's pretty, pretty wonderful to be in KJ's universe and working on this show and um it stars mark paul gosseler who used to be in saved by the bell plays our villain sir so if you're an old saved by the bell fan and uh you want to see him in a different light he is uh he is sir he is our kidnapper and he's wonderful and it's very strange because he's such a a lovely human and he plays such a bad guy <laughs> it's a pretty intriguing concept i don't i don't think i've heard of anything quite like that before so definitely kudos to whoever thought that up. Yes. Oh, that was the goddess in KJ Carroll, who also runs All American and All American oh. Homecoming. So basically doesn't sleep because <laughs> she has three shows on broadcast television. Oh my gosh. 
but she is an amazing human and like you know just like us grew up loving television grew up watching all these shows and now creates them and hires people like me to write them which is an awesome thing well we clearly could talk forever oh gosh yes but apparently (laughs) we have to stop sometime i love those 80s ladies and they're having a blast and they're wonderful on like i follow susan sullivan and she's always posting really like like good morning and be positive and everything love in the world yes i am stalking some of them hoping that (laughs) someday they'll follow me back and i can dm them go please come on our show (laughs) so if you ever get susan sullivan to come on and talk about falcon crest you have to let me at least just come listen (laughs) okay you got it i yeah falcon crest was one of my shows I I will try to hold it together. It might be my favorite nighttime soap of all time. Like Dallas for several years was great. Knott's Landing for several years was great. Falcon Crest, like Jim Mima was just, wow. And her and David Selby together, holy crap. (laughs) Knott's Landing is my favorite, I think, of, of them. Not the least of which because of the incomparable Donna Mills who played the most amazing villainous but not villain i mean she just she was somebody who knew what she wanted went after it but she wasn't evil exactly she was a three-dimensional person yeah i was always on abby's side i was always on abby side. <laughs> okay i'm sensing we need a whole different podcast maybe not even just an episode i think clearly you guys have a lot of opinion we're gonna have you back so uh, it's weird because y'all are so much fun. <laughs> I do want to run through the numbers. So, how many women were on this show behind the scenes? Based on my count on IMDb, five out of twenty-two directors are women. But that's not telling the whole story. The top three are all women, including top one, Debbie Allen, who directed eighty-three episodes of A Different World which is stunning. Until Debbie Allen started working on Grey's Anatomy a few years ago, I had no idea she had this whole career behind the camera. I didn't. She does get some flowers. She doesn't get nearly enough. And she certainly didn't get nearly enough on this show from the Emmys. It was nominated three times only. I know. I'm so stunned at that. Out of 144 episodes, six seasons, Nominated three times for technical direction, Mm -hmm. which they didn't even name her in, and two guest things. (laughs) Don't even. Because, thankfully, she does have 20 Emmy nominations and five wins, two Tonys, and a Golden Globe, and she got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 1991. Yes. Yes. Did you, in the Honeymoon episode, that's like a bit, in the Honeymoon episode, when she's cleaning her star. It's a bet. It's delightful. Yeah, she's amazing. I Nobody has earned a Kennedy Center honor more completely, I don't think. I will also say that of the writers on A Different World, 20 of the 47 listed writers were women. If you think about like 20 women at that, like those years, that's... That's remarkable. Yeah. Outstanding. That was clearly very intentional because you could find a lot of shows from back then that did not have that level. Of female involvement. It was very intentional. And I think it was Debbie Allen and I think it was Susan Fales Hill, who we will be talking to on this show for one of our episodes. Stay tuned. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay. Thank you. Please come back. I would love to come back. Thank you. This was so much fun. So much fun. And really, it would be really hard for you to name an 80s show that you wanted me to talk about that I hadn't really seen. Okay. So. We are definitely going to take you up on that. We are definitely going to take you up on that. Thank you so much. This was so fun. Thanks, Nicole. In today's audiography, find A Different World streaming on Max. And you can learn more about Nicole Levy at NicoleLevy.com. N-I-C-E-O-L-E-L-E-V-Y.com. There will also be a link in our description. On that site, you can find her article, What I Learned Watching 1,000 Television Shows, and we'll have a link that will take you directly there.
And of course, the book today is The Writer's Room Survival Guide. Don't Screw Up the Lunch Order and Other Keys to a Happy Writer's Room by Nicole Levy. We hope 80s TV Ladies brings you joy and laughter and lots of fabulous old and new shows to watch, all of which will lead us forward toward being amazing ladies of the 21st century. It's a different world.